Good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to speak to uh, uh, such a, a varied audience. I know you're from very, uh, probably a, a, a multiple a multitude of different different backgrounds. My name is Beverly Davis. I'm the director of the Foreign Credential Recognition Program at uh, Human Resources and Skills Development Canada. I'm also the federal co-chair for the uh, Foreign Qualification Recognition Working Group, which is a, a federal, provincial, territorial working group. I'm here with my colleague uh, Margot Morris, who's also the is the provincial co-chair. So I know. It's great to see so many people, as I said, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, everybody has such a, an interest in the, in the framework. So we're here today to talk about the uh, Pan-Canadian Framework for the Assessment and Recognition of Foreign Qualifications, our work to date, and the, and the next steps. So just briefly to run over our uh, outline, we'll talk about um, the, the framework. Um, talk a little bit uh, well, uh, about the pathway to recognition in Canada. Marco will take us uh, through that. Looking at the one-year the one year, um, timely service commitment that's in the framework. Talk about the uh, target occupations for this year and for uh, 20, uh, 2012. Talk about some of the things we've done to date, um, including some consultations that we held, some action plans that we're developing. And we'll talk about our partnerships as well and uh, how the FQR relates to, the FQR framework relates to other initiatives and uh, some of the next steps forward. And we'll also have a slide on our working group contacts uh, in all the jurisdictions uh, who are members. So just in, in terms of uh, some context, uh, we're no doubt all familiar with the current trends of an aging workforce and an aging society. And these are, are pointing to the growing importance of immigration to, our, to sustain our labor force growth and our population. Current projections estimate that by 2016, immigration will contribute to all net labor force growth in Canada. So that's, that's just a few years away. And 100% of net population growth by 2030. Yet many immigrants struggle to find employment commensurate with their level of education and experience. And this was even worse with the recent economic downturn, which had a significant impact on employment. A recent StatsCan study entitled Immigrants Working in Regulated Occupations found that based on the, census, the 2006 census, that there were 284,000 employed foreign educated immigrants from fields of study that would normally lead to a regulated occupation, such as engineering, teaching, or medicine. Of this number, only 24% were working in their, trained, in their trained professions. So that's a very low number. The foreign qualification assessment and recognition processes can be confusing, lengthy, costly, and inconsistent across the country. But there, there has been progress. The FQR framework was launched by federal, provincial, and territorial ministers almost a year ago. And there are exciting projects in place that are making a real difference. But we need to do more. And there is a compelling story to take action, as we've seen by some of these statistics. We need to continue to build on this momentum and do more so immigrants can find work in their field for everyone's benefit. So the, the FQR framework, it's, uh, it articulates a new joint pan-Canadian vision. It's really governments working together to improve out the outcomes of immigrants. And the vision is a fair and competitive labour market environment where immigrants have the opportunity to fully use their education, skills and work experience for their benefit and for Canada's collective prosperity. The framework represents a public commitment by all governments to take action on the issue of qualification recognition. It's principle-based. Processes and practices must be fair, transparent, timely, and consistent. It's collaborative. Successful implementation requires a collaborative, supportive, and respectful environment. So working in partnership, partnerships with regulatory bodies, uh, provinces and, and federal government, stakeholders, uh, lots of educational institutions, uh, lots of partners. It's also results-focused. By December 31st, 2010, an initial set of target occupations are expected to have identified actions towards implementation of the framework. 
leading up to December 31st, 2012, a second set of target occupations will be engaged starting early next year. So the principles, when we talk about principle-based fairness, means the criteria used for determining recognition of qualifications are objective, reasonable, do not exhibit bias, and are necessary, and equal treatment in requirements for international and Canadian trained. Transparency means requirements for applying to a specific occupation as well as the methods for assessment and criteria for recognition of foreign qualifications are fully described, easy to understand, and widely accessible to immigrants. The applicant is informed of other options if full recognition is not possible. Timeliness means the assessment and recognition of foreign qualifications as well as the communication of assessment decisions are carried out promptly and efficiently. Consistency means the methods of assessment and criteria used for determining recognition of qualifications for specific regulated occupations are mutually acceptable in each province and territory so that the results of the assessment processes are mutually recognized. So I'll turn it over to Margot to take us through the, uh, the pathway. Hi, thanks. Uh, Margot Morris, the provincial co-chair. I'm, I'm from Manitoba, from Manitoba Labour and Immigration. So nice to be with you here today again to talk about the framework. And um, one, one key cornerstone of the framework is, is this pathway graphic that we've developed. And uh, it is a diagram that um, really, you know, uh, illustrates how an immigrant would potentially go through the pathway and is the framework for uh, ex explanation of the desired outcomes, what we're trying to achieve along that pathway. So just consider, you know, yourself as a newcomer coming to this country and trying to figure out the maze of steps, people, governments, organizations involved to, to help you figure out how to practice your profession after having practiced it maybe for for many years in your own country as a professional, uh, and to come to Canada to try and, and, and get to work. Um, this, again, hopefully helps us to, to base our work, you know, in the eyes of the newcomer. And, and are we trying to assist that newcomer or assess their qualifications based on what that individual needs or based on, again, what we think, you know, the internationally trained generally need and some of our assumptions there? Um, so w what are we trying to work towards? Um, the desired outcomes for the first box, pre-arrival and preparation supports, aim to, as early as possible in the immigration process, support immigrants to have access to a reliable information and assessment services before they arrive, because people are preparing for that huge life transition for quite a long time before they actually get, get here, and, and the processes do take time. What can they do in that stage? Around assessment, the second box, that assessment and recognition methods will be reasonable, objective, fair, transparent, and that regulatory authorities, who really are the center cornerstone, right, for, the, for that work uh, in, in the regulated professions, share that information regarding the pr approaches that they use so we can work towards some consistency. Not that they're all the same across all jurisdictions, but that there's some consistency. Um, recognition, that, the assess that assessment and recognition related decisions, and you can see here that we've broken them into three parts. There's a uh, you, you part, partial, you've got some <laughs> of what's required for practicing um, in, in Canada. You, you, you have it, you, you will be recognized in the center box, and that no, you really have to think about some alternate, alternate work so that those decisions can be communicated in a timely fashion. That's what we're trying to do, speed it up. Bridge to licensure, again, in the top light green boxes, um, ensuring that immigrants are aware of uh, bridge or gap opportunities so that they can upgrade and meet the entry requirements, again, in a timely fashion. And workforce participation that uh, immigrants and employers can, you know, have supports to be able to bridge immigrants successfully into the workforce to be able to practice effectively and again in a timely fashion. Another outcome that we're working to as well is to report to Canadians and to all the stakeholders involved in this work on an annual basis so we know that progress is being achieved and on what basis. So, so maybe just a little bit more about um, the pathway and, and what that involves. Again, back to the pre-arrival stage. Um, 
you, you know what we're trying to achieve. Um, people need more information, self-assessment approaches earlier, not just information dump, but you know being able to <laughs> to be able to come to decisions about practicing their career and what it's going to take actually realistically to practice, and to again have you know to be able to take some of the real steps earlier. So preparing all the documents that they need, uh, being able to either self-assess or ha go through the actual assessment pro processes to be able to take exams overseas and to be able to better plan and guide and to understand what it's going to take because too often people are, are disappointed and it's, it's a, a, a slope downward for, for underemployment for very highly skilled people that we need in Canada. Uh, in the assessment piece, again, we need to strengthen those processes and recognize, of course, professions have different focuses in how they use the academic, the paper, equivalency step, how they look at language and what's really needed to practice and to be successful for recognition, how experience can be factored in because often these are mid-career professionals. They're not people at a university who haven't been in the workplace. They've been in workplaces. And how, again, exams are factored in to, to again, achieve, you know, so, so regulators know and they, that occupational standards are met. So we, we certainly we're hearing a lot in the assessment area and, and our, the focus of our work so far um, has been with regulators who, you know, are, are central again in, in defining occupational standards, def defining competencies more and more, and again, building those tools um, to, to, to get to that recognition decision. We're hearing very much that academic credentials assessment pieces can be worked on, but again, that's the paper piece. How, how can we maximize use of competency-based tools? How can we rationalize the use of those all those tools and resources that you bring as educators into this so that they all connect and they all make sense. So whether there's a self-assessment piece, how that links to the real assessment piece, how, uh, you know, how, how that links to the exam, how, how that links to bridge training, so that again we're looking at you know, what the individual brings and, we, and we, we're not guessing. Um, it's the same with the exams, you know, often it's that articulation challenge right now. How, how can all these tools be articulated to the exam? How can those results be factored into the bridging or upgrading opportunities? So people aren't starting over and taking stuff that they just don't need to take, um, but filling the gaps. And again, how can our educational design uh, be addressed to fill the gaps in a modularized fashions and accessible fashions? Um, Related to um, bridging programs, there's certainly a need for sustainable, accessible programming. There's a need to um, have programming that's accessible for small volume occupations and for smaller jurisdictions. I mean, we've seen some, there's some fabulous work going on um, where there's the concentrations, the density, the, you know, the collaboration uh, and the expertise, but it's very uneven across the country. How can we, again, ensure that the few OTs that are really needed in PEI <laughs> can get through a process to practice. Um, and in any, any example, of course. Um, in communication and language, part of, often part of bridging, um, often a common gap because so much practice, professional practice, regulated, non-regulated, is culture, culturally determined, right? And, and so, um, you know, there's a need, you know, a common need often for training around what's it like to practice the profession in Canada, to, pra to, to work in this workplace in Canada um, as part of orientation, as part of um, assessing and, 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 you know, as part of the process to support success for the applicant and not to be the screen out, right? Where and how is that most effectively placed along this pathway? Um, individual and employer support, certainly people need financial. A common theme is the need for financial supports for applicants, the need for employers as well to, to have support for internships, for the requirements for clinical experience, for having preceptors or supervisors that are effective with the internationally trained, and certainly for training um, to maximize the benefits of diversity in the workplace.
Um, to move to move on from all that substantial substantial work um, one of, yeah, around the whole pathway uh, in each occupation, timely service commitment has been established, and governments agree that uh, this work should be carried out prompt, promptly and efficiently. And a one-year commitment to timely service was established in this framework um, to 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 be a marker, and it refers to the length of time to conduct the assessment of qualifications including education and work, and to communicate that outcome to the individual. So it includes the early steps, looking at the documents, good standing, equivalency of education, equivalency of work, um, and we're asking that that occurs within one year. Um, we, it, it is recognized that in some pathways, other exams, uh, practice requirements, gap or bridge training requirements, a provision, work in a provisional sense, um, additional work experience requirements do take more time and, and, and make the process a bit longer, but it, it often is very valuable time if it, if it again is planned, designed, and working towards the recognition outcome. Um, so there are many, it is recognized, recognized that there are many decision points along some of these additional requirements. But the, the, the one year timeline refers to the earlier steps and um, it, with recognition that often the final decision may take longer than the one year. But this commitment to timely service is just one of, uh, of many of the principles, and one of them being timeliness overall. So again, we're seeking a commitment for the regulated professions working with us in the framework and to, to, to uh, be aware and to meet this commitment by the end of December this year, um, and that continue their commitment to work around timeliness for the overall pathway as well. And all principles of the framework are equally important to its implementation, and we're looking to support opportunities so that all processes are timely, fair, transparent, and, consist and, and, and work towards consistency across the entire pathway. So here's another um, graphic of what we're talking about, that timely service commitment, that marker for the early assessment decisions that can include any or some of these early steps, and that re with recognition that the overall pathway may take longer, but again, building a commitment to, for all participating parties to, to work towards timeliness of the whole pathway. Um, we've been talking about who we're working with. Uh, the first group is listed here, um, architects, engineers, financial auditors and accountants, the three accounting designations basically, med lab, occupational therapists, pharmacy, physio and registered nurses. And the next tranche we're starting to work with um, coming in the new year. With these target occupations, action plans will be developed with regulatory bodies uh, and with other relevant stakeholders in order to, again, identify areas that they are tackling to improve the pathway to meet the principles of the framework and those desired outcomes that I mentioned earlier. So what have we been doing with that first group that you saw there? Um, we have been having face-to-face uh, -face consultations with each of them. We met with each of them usually for day-long meetings. Uh, and the objectives of those meetings were to identify what's going on and to look at uh, challenges, gaps, and what can be done with it, simply. And in order to come up with priorities, strategic priorities for a commitment to keep the work going collaboratively, to keep that continuous improvement going. And these consultations were very rich, rich discussions. Um, um, we learned that the, the pathways are diverse, of course, by occupation, by jurisdiction, um, that there's different ways of doing assessment often, it, um, uh, especially where there's not a centralized process. That the requirements, um, certainly, of assessment are based on skills, knowledge, education, work experience, but how that's done way different <laughs> in each occupation. There's a lot happening, as you know, uh, likely, and as certainly the regulators are well aware of um, across the country, but it's not happening equitably. 
um, as we talked about the small volume, small jurisdiction issues. There's different capacities as well, stages of development, knowledge, expertise, use of the resources. And there's a great need for sustainable approaches and assist, you know, funding to get there. Uh, if we want a systematic approach, a systematic pathway, the resources and the effort has to be there. And let, you know, luckily there's a very strong government commitment to do that. And as well that there's legislative and policy barriers to getting there. Not only the design challenge, but also other structural pieces that have to be looked at. We learned in these consultations that um, there's a lot of scope for work in each profession that we talk to. Um, some are far ahead, but even, even there, there's always work to do to make that pathway streamlined. And what was even more significant to, to a lot of us is that there's a lot of opportunities that cross. They cross across occupations, clusters like health or business areas, and they cross all the occupations as well. So this, this collaborative effort is, is, is really kind of the base for, you know, in, in our area anyway, trying to, um, to, to look at systematic uh, opportunities. And there's also a great appetite for some of the pan-Canadian work, which, which is what we're focusing on. So again, what we can do cons consistently, not the same, but consistently, um, that can be more cost-effective, prevent that duplication, allow for economies of scale, and build on the best practices. Um, we learned... Um, about what the priorities were from the regulators as well, in addition to some of those themes. Um, better work around bridging programs, as we talked about, around pre-arrival supports, and around competency assessment tools, which include the PLAR, were the, were the top three, as well as individual supports and employer supports. Uh, so those were really four of the top, top themes that we heard across all the occupations. We also heard that work needs to be done around academic credentials piece and the communication and language piece that I mentioned, uh, work to uh, articulate the exams with the whole pathway process, and of course to do re more research and to really examine the opportunities of, of more formalized agreements like MOUs or MRAs to, to streamline these pathways. So out of this work, oops, going the wrong way, um, our intent by the end of the year is to develop action plans. And again, they're viewed as a way of ha establishing a commitment to ongoing work and ongoing improvement, to kind of set a road map. Um, they will identify, you know, what's underway, and in some cases there's some stellar work going on, um, and big, big initiatives to change things going on. And also, what are some of the next steps forward to that, that there's a commitment to take? Um, as well, um, these, while there's no assurance that these action plans, you know, that the money will flow because there's always decision making in that process, it will set a course and a commitment for, again, that collaboration to work together to improve things. And our goal is to have those action plans in, in place for that initial list of all the occupations by the end of December. So it's been a very busy year. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Bev now. Yeah, so we've been coming back to this uh, theme of partnership um, time and time again. And just to, uh, to go over it in a little bit more detail, uh, as you're probably aware now, foreign qualification recognition, it really is a, a, a complex issue. And partnerships are really key among governments with stakeholders and, you know, we, we, we can't do it alone. In fact, multiple stakeholders are involved in, the, in framework implementation. There's nearly 500 regulatory bodies, five provincially mandated credential assessment agencies, professional associations, educational institutions, immigrant serving organizations, sector councils, employers, and individual immigrants. So success means working together, and it means respecting recognizing differing starting points and capacity of stakeholders, respect for jurisdictional authority and continuous improvement through accountability, measurement, and public reporting. There's, 
In terms of the role, the role of governments, there's c consulting and engaging with stakeholders, as, as Margot talked about the process that uh, we went through, coming to speaking at conferences such as this to raise awareness and understanding, support stakeholder efforts through funding and other means, collaborate and share information, report on progress is a commitment in the framework to public reporting. The role of stakeholders and, and regulators is to work with governments to develop and implement tools, resources and processes to achieve the framework's principles and desired outcomes. While the Federal Provincial Territorial Forum of Labour Market Ministers has the lead on the framework, other government departments and provincial and territorial ministries play important roles. The, the FQR working group that we, that, uh, we co-chair is an ad hoc group under the FLMM, the Forum of Labour Market Ministers, tasked with coordinating implementation of the framework within and across governments. Government members represent labour market, employment, human resources, immigration and citizenship, health, education and training. So quite a, a diverse, uh, diverse group. The FQR framework coexists with other initiatives. FQR and labor, mo labor mobility, for example, are, we see it as two sides of the same coin. One focuses on international mobility and the other on domestic mobility. Once an international worker is certified in one jurisdiction, he or she is able to work in any other jurisdiction. However, unlike Chapter 7 of the Agreement on Internal Trade uh, concerning labor mobility, the framework does not articulate what regulators may or may not do with respect to FQR. It is not prescriptive, nor does it include any consequences for regulatory bodies or other stakeholders. As we saw, it's principle-based. We have a vision based on partnership, working together. Legislation has been enacted in some provinces to ensure that registration practices are fair, transparent, objective and impartial. So we need to work and respect that uh, legislation as well. The framework and its principles are consistent with these other initiatives. So in terms of, uh, of next steps, the FQR Working Group in collaboration with regulators and other stakeholders will follow up, as Margot had mentioned, with the first set of target occupations to make sure that the Pan-Canadian Action Plans are in place by December 31st. We'll continue to meet with other national stakeholder organizations to further advance the framework objectives. We, uh, we need to talk to uh, groups like the Alliance of Credential uh, Assessment Agencies as they have a role to play in the assessment, uh, in the assessment part of the pathway. We also want to hook up with the, uh, with the organizations who deal with trades, because even though trades aren't a priority occupation, they're very important as well. So we're out there and we're speaking at conferences, uh, meeting with these other stakeholders to build awareness and understanding of the framework. Our intention is also to release our first annual report on the FQR framework implementation in spring 2011 and begin consulting with the second set of occupations in, in early next year. Finally, we have a list, and I guess this will be, a presentation will be posted on the website. But these are our uh, working group uh, contacts. Um, for each, uh, for each jurisdiction as well as uh, the federal government. So uh, we encourage you uh, to get in touch with your provincial territorial, territorial contact for jurisdiction-specific questions and issues. <laughs>